Sometimes on this journey, get lost in my mistakes. It looks to me like weakness is a canvas for your strength. And my story isn't over, my story's just begun. And failure won't define me, cause that's what my father does. Yeah, failure won't define me, cause that's what my father does. Good morning and happy Father's Day. Good morning. Oh, here we are. Good morning. Happy Father's Day. We are so glad that you have chosen to spend part of your day with us. Whether you're here in person or joining us online, we are so glad to have you this morning. My name is Kristen McGrew. I'm the director of Children's Ministry, a.k.a. the chaos coordinator of all things happening in this week. And I think I have the best job in the whole entire world. I wouldn't trade it for a million dollars. I love it so much. Tomorrow morning, we will have a little over 600 children in this building, plus another 250 or so volunteers. Um, so this building is going to be buzzing, and we have a unique opportunity to share Jesus with some people who might never hear it otherwise. So um, we covet your prayers this week. We would love for you to pray all the rain away. That would be great. Um, and just that this building is full of people who will share the love of Jesus and be the hands and feet of Jesus with so many people in our community. So we thank you for that. If you were part of helping to transform this building this week, thank you so, so much. This is a huge team effort. It cannot be done by one or two people or even one or two ministries. So um, thank you for all of those who helped 
uh, kind of make this happen. So if you will uh, stand with us, we're going to get this service started this morning by praying the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for all of your grace and your mercy and your goodness, God, that fills us and allows us to be the hands and feet of Jesus here on earth. God, I pray a blessing over this week. God, we will have the unique opportunity to share your message with so many people and grow the kingdom by the dozens, God. And I just pray a special blessing over each and every person that will be here. For those that will be praying with us, God, I thank you for them. I just ask that you go before us, blaze a trail, God, and allow us to do a great and mighty work this week. God, I pray a blessing over each and every person that's here today and those that are joining us online. God, I ask that you heal all of the sickness and comfort those who need comfort. God, we are so grateful to be in this place and to be able to share your love with others. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. So glad that you joined us on Father's Day. Happy Father's Day to all of our special dads and mentors. Um, thank you for coming and sharing it with us today. As we sing this first song, we're going to talk about the love of God, and I just can't think of a more perfect song. Really, today, our Father is perfect. We are imperfect, but He is perfect. Amen. And so we're going to look to Him today. Y'all join us for worship, and let's just press in and see what God has for us this morning. We welcome you in this place today, God. Do in us what you want to do, Lord. Nothing can separate. Even if I ran away, your love never fails. I know I still make mistakes, but you have new mercies for me every day. Your love never fails. You'll never fail us, Lord. You stay the same.
declare it together this morning. You make, you make all things work together for my good. You make all things work together for my Even when we don't see it, Lord, you make. so many of us just at different seasons in our life different places and as we stand around the room how beautiful that we're all able to sing that together finding ourselves just in different different times in life Lord some of us just beginning our journey and with so many questions and others of us just trusting you for this next season and what you'll bring and so we just collectively as your church and as your people God, as brothers and sisters, we claim that over our lives. Lord, help us to trust you even when we don't see it. God, especially on those days when we get up and we don't feel it. Lord, help us to trust you and just know that you're always there and that you'll continue to be. Where I saw death, there you saw life. You ran to my rescue. Can't wrap my around the cross how far you would go for me the sacrifice it cuts so deep your wounds are my healing I mercy's crying so bittersweet the sound me to my knees. Oh, how amazing your love came pouring out. Oh, how amazing the grace that the 
single heart that's here today and you know exactly what's going on in our lives I pray for those who are tired that you would just replenish them God I pray for those who feel hopeless that you would offer them a sense of hope and expectation about what's to come I pray that in this message this morning that you would stir our hearts Lord help us to just draw close to you and not to ever God, get to the point where discouragement sets us back completely. We're going to have those seasons where we're discouraged. But, Lord, be there guiding and pulling and directing and leading us all along the way. God, as we look to you and your face, we know that you have what we need. And we lean into that today and we trust you completely. We love you and we give you back this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks so much for singing, everybody. You can be seated. Okay, dads, let's go ahead and get started, guys. Now, some of you have already let me know how uncomfortable you were in last week's meeting. So tonight, we're going to try to respect each other's boundaries. What? Tonight, we've also got a guest with us. 
David, and would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah. Um, hey, guys. I'm David. David. Hey, 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 hey. How many kids do you have, David? None. At least not at the moment. Uh, my wife is pregnant, and uh, she should be delivering any day now. That's great. So Super. Oh, great. Awesome. Who would like to go first? Anyone. Anyone. I'll go. Perfect. Todd? Yes. My daughter and I went to the mall, and she said she wanted to take the stairs to the second level. And I said, I don't trust stairs because they're always up to something. <laughs> Todd, I'm sorry that happened. Okay. I encourage you to try to resist the urge to make jokes like that. My turn? Okay. Can I go? Okay. Yesterday, actually, my daughter got home and she asked me how my day was. And I said, well, a guy tried to sell me a coffin, but that's the last thing I need. Oh, Jerry, oh, Jerry that Jerry. joke is dead on arrival. Because it's the last thing I need. David, <laughs> how about you? Oh, I, I didn't I didn't say this. This is a safe zone. Just jump on in. Yeah, I, I'm, I guess I'm just scared of being a dad. I'm afraid I'm going to start telling bad jokes just like my dad. Well, it might be in our nature. We can fight against it. Hey, speaking of nature, I tried to catch some fog yesterday. I missed. <laughs> M-I-S-T. Oh, You're a monster. I, this is where the boundary is. I'm done. This is where you are. Hello? Really? Okay, yeah, no. Uh, yeah, I'll be right there. That was Julie. Her water just broke. I guess the baby finally ran out of womb. <laughs> I'm gonna be a dad. Don't you think you should be going? Oh, yeah. So I told my wife she drew her eyebrows too high. She seemed surprised. an animal. <laughs> Good morning. We can do that all day if y'all want to. I hope everybody's doing good this morning. I want to welcome you and thank you so much for joining us today at Community Life Church on this beautiful Sunday morning. My name is Scott Verano, and I am the lead pastor here at, at this circus, and um, we are so glad to have you here, whether you're in person or online. Um, we're just, just honored that you're here on this Father's Day. Can we give our dads a big round of applause? Yeah. You, usually on Father's Day, all the dads go snapper fishing, and not with six to eight foot seas, you're not. <laughs> so today you go to church. That's how that works out. So, so glad to have you here. Um, it means the world to us. There's a lot of places you could be, and, and we appreciate you being here. Um, a couple quick announcements before we, we jump into the message today. So um, we're so excited about tomorrow-ish. Um, no, we're excited. Totally excited. At, at whatever time it is, 600 plus children are going to descend upon us, and we are as ready as you could possibly be for 600 children to descend upon us, and um, we're, just, we're just looking forward to sharing the gospel with them. Um, and here, here's the message, so if you're praying this week, we are going to let each and every one of them know that they are priceless to God, that they are treasured, and so that's the message that we're going to be putting out, so you can pray specifically for that, pray for every adult and high school student that'll be here. Um, working at VBS is the best form of birth control that you could ever have. No, that wasn't fun. It's a dad joke. No, that wasn't good. Oh, y'all, that's tough. Um, but we're excited about it. So here's my um, public service announcements for, for you. If, if you're looking for a way to help out, maybe you haven't been able to jump in at some point. There are always a, a few last minute things that we need. And so I asked Kristen before the service and she said, we always need bottled water and we always need those individual small Gatorades or Powerades um, that we use to help the kids once we do get outside, depending on the weather, um, to help them out. So if you want to go by and pick up a few cases of that, drop them off, we'll unload the car, we'll get them inside and uh, we'll just go ahead and stockpile and get ready for the week. And then also on Monday and Tuesday, if you live anywhere in our vicinity, I'm just going to go ahead and apologize. 
Uh, it takes at least two days to figure out the drop-off and the pickup. And if you live on Soundside, I really apologize. It, it, gets a, it just gets insane. We tried to get people to not block driveways. We try to pull cars over so you guys can get through. Um, when it comes to pickup in the afternoon, we're going to queue everybody up on the loop road in two lanes of traffic to try and get everybody around. But, but here's what I always love to say. If anyone loves you so much that they tell you you're number one, don't re- yeah, you got it. Okay, don't, re- don't, don't return the favor and tell them that they're number one. Just in Jesus' name, smile and wave, and it'll all get better, I promise, by, by Tuesday. Um, one of the things that we do every single year, and this is a warning, but it's also an invitation, is at the end of the week, um, we invite all of those students that, to come back, and we're going to do Vacation Bible School right here Sunday morning. So for some of you that you know you can't handle it, that's your heads up. For the rest of you, I want to ask you to consider something. There are, of the 600 students, I know we can account for half of them. Half of them, we don't know if they have a church. We don't know if they've ever been in church. And we invite them to bring their parents back next Sunday. We clear out a giant pit right here, and we go through all five days of the lessons. They get to show the songs they've learned, the lessons they've learned. We go through the whole thing. It's the craziest church service you'll ever go to. But for me, their parents will be here to celebrate those moments, and I would love for you to be here to welcome them, to love on them, and just put a smile on their faces and not let them be so freaked out like maybe you were when you walked in today. And so I just want to invite you to do that. And here's the other reason I say that, is at some point during the week, if you're a parent, you're going to want to walk in and check things out. Please don't do that. You will be tased. Um, I'm kidding. (laughs) Kind of. Everything, we we believe in security. If we're going to be given 600 children, we want 600 children to go back to their homes at least by the end of the week. So, um, So everybody's background check, we take that very seriously. So if you come in, if you have a reason to come into the church, come into the front desk, check in, and we'll get you to where you need to go. But that's why we do uh, next Sunday morning, so everybody can experience and see the thing in all of its glory and splendor and crazy, and and we're just excited about it. Um, And if you want to pray, and maybe you kind of throughout the week just sort of forget, the day that we talk about Jesus specifically is on Thursday. That's the day we talk about grace and metamorphosis and the butterfly that changes, the, 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 the caterpillar that used to sting and hurt now becomes the one that's transformed and looks so beautiful and, and you are treasured. That's the day when we talk about Jesus. So pray for salvation. Pray that God will do a deep work in the heart of the, the students on that day. And, um, and, and I think I would just kind of close this thought by saying thank you. <clears throat> There's not a lot of churches, i.e. you, that would allow us to literally wrestle away an entire Sunday. And you would allow yourself to come in here and be, let's be honest, it's uncomfortable. Normally my seat's over there. I'm kind of freaking out a little bit. Um, I didn't have my seat to sit in. I, like, I'm, a, I'm a creature, not, not that I don't want somebody else to have my seat. I'm a creature of habit. And, and so things are a little bit disheveled. And, and so thank you for allowing us to put forward the resource, twenty five dollars to $30,000 to pull this off. Um, all of the staffing, everybody on the team is focused right on Vacation Bible School, all of the volunteer hours that you put in to do this. And it means the world to me that you're willing to invest in this next generation because it is so, so vitally important. So, um, so can you guys help me in, in giving yourselves a big round of applause? I appreciate you for doing that. Thank you. All right. Um, and, and I would just love to close out that thought by telling you what our mission is. At Community Life, we love God, we love our neighbor, and we believe that our mission is to connect people to Jesus, and so we take it serious. We put everything that we have into connecting people to Jesus because we believe that Jesus is the source of life. We're not always going to be perfect in the way that we execute that, but hopefully we'll get better over time as we continue to lean into it. So if you find yourself here today struggling, uh, let one of us know, either here or maybe stop by out of the desk outside. We'll connect you. We'll figure out a way to pray with you and see if there's not a way that we can, can support you um, through, through whatever struggles that you're dealing with. Okay, um, so today we start a new series-ish So I was torn, right? So I kind of put it out there and said, you guys let me know. Do you want to go into Colossians or do you want to go into Psalms? And like everybody voted Colossians. And so here's the challenge. If I started Colossians today, then Vacation Bible School, you guys will forget everything we've talked about in two weeks, I promise. I don't remember today at tomorrow. So you would never probably hold it all the way through. So what I'm going to do is start with Colossians Light. Like I'm going to bridge for you from the Jerusalem council that we talked about last week all the way to Paul finding himself in prison in Rome 
and how that really sets the stage for letters like the letter he wrote to Colossae, to um, the Philippians, to Ephesians, um, to, to th those letters that he wrote. We're going to work all the way to get there. Now, I'll just go ahead and tell you, a lot of this information that you're going to get is outside of the text, but I hope it's information that you can use to help inform your reading and most importantly, if you're a believer and maybe you've been going to this church for a long time, I want to connect you to God's greater story. Because we're here today because of the work of Paul and Peter and all of those folks that went before us. And there will be an entire generation that will come after us that will benefit from the work that you're doing in your, in your lives today. And so my hope is to connect you to the greater story so you can see how it unfolds. Now, if you're here today and maybe you're visiting for the first time, and, and maybe God's not your thing, but you, you find yourself here because your child drug you in here. Um, the message today will be about uh, like a historical person, Paul, who really transformed the world. And his ability to use his talents and his gifts to transform the world around him. And maybe my, my thought for you is to, con is to consider that in light of the things that you have influence over. So it's Father's Day, and dads or grandpas or soon-to-be or hope-to-be or mentors, we have influence in our lives, and maybe talking about Paul reinforces that for us and lets us know that we can use that influence to, to, to bring about change in our hearts and in our lives. So maybe if you're not necessarily a believer, maybe you can see that in today's message as we sort of wrestle with the text. So I'm going to back up and we're going to start all the way um, and just kind of recap Acts chapter 15 by starting with this guy named Paul. So last week we had Paul at this thing called the Jerusalem Council. So just to kind of shorten up this side of it, Paul is one of the original apostles, but before he was an apostle, he started off as a Pharisee that was persecuting Christians. He's a Jew that didn't like this idea of Jesus, thought it was a false belief, and so he went after Christians to get him. And along the way, Jesus shows up and literally changes his heart. And so he switches teams, and now he's all team Jesus. So he's Jewish, but he's team Jesus, and he just starts to spread the word. And as he spreads the word, those people that he was originally on the team of now want to kill him. So he has to go and hide out in his hometown, which is Tarsus, and stay there for a period of time. Well, while that period of time is unfolding, this gospel message starts to expand in the Gentile population. So I said this last week, but I'll go ahead and say it again. You fall into one of two categories. You're either Jewish, and if you're Jewish, you, you know it, or you're a Gentile. So there's those who are Jewish, and then there's everybody else. Well, the faith was growing in the, in the Jewish belief system because Jesus was believed to be the Jewish Messiah. Well, at some point, the Gentiles started to believe that maybe Jesus was the Messiah too, and the faith started to grow in this Gentile world. Enter chapter 15. Barnabas goes down into this place called Antioch, and Barnabas sees what's going on in the Gentile world, and he realizes he needs help, so he calls Paul in to help him, and they just start growing the church. Not just Jews who are coming to believe in Jesus, but now Gentiles. And they start making these missionary journeys, telling of the faith, until ultimately they realized they had gotten to an impasse and they needed an answer from the hub of the belief system, which was back in Jerusalem. Do these Gentiles have to become Jewish or can they accept the faith just as they are and live into belief in Christ? So they go back to Jerusalem for this council meeting, which we call the Jerusalem Council because we're really creative. And, um, and they have this meeting. And in that meeting, you have Peter and Paul and Barnabas and, um, and James, the brother of Jesus, all get up and speak. And the Jerusalem Council rules and says, yes, Gentiles can be accepted in the faith and they do not have to go through all the Jewish ritual or rites of purification minus just a few things. And so we find ourselves there in, in um, Acts chapter 15 with this new awareness of the gospel and with Paul. So let's, let's talk about Paul for a second because Paul leaves that setting and he never slows down. What Paul does in his life is he literally transforms the world ultimately getting us to where we are today in some of our understandings of relationships and marriage and, and how we deal with one another because of some of the things that he wrote and because of how he leaned into society. So he lived for another roughly 17 years after the Jerusalem Council. And in 17 years, changed the world. So 
leaves the Jerusalem council, and for the next seven years, him and his buddy Barnabas and a couple other folks, they start to travel. And so we've got a map that we're going to throw up here on the screen. And down here in the bottom right corner, you see Jerusalem in purple. And up there in the top right corner, you see Rome, and there's Italy. And so that kind of gives you a lay of the land. Here in the center screen, where it says Asia, just below Asia, you can see Ephesus. Um, this is where the Aegean Sea is located. Many of his journeys centered in and around this place. So he might get there by land, but he would cross over. He would take a boat. He just traveled this region. So you'll recognize some of the names. Um, Ephesus, you see up there in the top in the center, Philippi, uh, Thessalonica, um, uh, Corinth down here. All of these places where he would have bounced back and forth just sharing this gospel message. Multiple journeys that he went on just sharing the faith and telling all of these people about Jesus. One of the, one of the, the messages that he carried with him from the Jerusalem council was whatever I go do and whoever I proclaim the message with, I'm always going to remember those back in Jerusalem because there's a drought and a famine. And so he would collect money from time to time and he would bring it back to Jerusalem to really support that early church. And so occasionally he would go back to Jerusalem. And so on one such occasion, he finds himself back in Jerusalem and you could go to Acts 21 through 27 and read this story. He gets back into Jerusalem and he had been followed by all of these non-believing in Jesus, Jewish people who had lived around the Mediterranean rim who were angry about the message that he was proclaiming. And when he shows up in Jerusalem, they arrest him, they throw him in prison, and they want to kill him. So 21 all the way through 27, if you want to read a great story, read it. It's like a Hollywood um, a script, if you will, all of this intrigue and hiding prisoners and moving prisoners from one place to another. And so-and-so says this and the word ekes out and, and so-and-so finds about it. And it just, it's just incredible how the story unfolds until ultimately Paul gets himself to a place to where the Jews are moving towards killing him. And so he has no choice but to declare to the Roman soldiers that he is a Roman citizen. And so in his life from Tarsus, he was born as a Roman citizen which means that he has rights that many Jewish people do not have. And that right is to, to trial by the emperor if he so claims to need that. And so as he sees the end of his life approaching in that setting, he has to claim that he's a citizen, which means now he has to go on a journey to Rome to plead his case to Emperor Nero. So they put him on a boat in chapter 27, and it doesn't go really well. There's a shipwreck. He finds himself stranded on the island of Malta. Um, and it's just, once again, it's a cool story where he's there and these, these people that lived on the island show up to help them. And um, he goes to put firewood on the fire and a snake bites him. And so they're convinced that he's a devil because he was bit and that was their sign to see that. But then he doesn't die. So now they're convinced he's a God, right? So it's, it's gone from one side to the other. And so they start worshiping him. And what does Paul do? He starts to tell them about Jesus. And these people take all of these Roman soldiers and they move them on up into Rome and get them settled down. So in a second, I'm going to read for you Acts chapter 28 because it's going to set for you the stage of where we get letters like letters to the Colossians. But, but here's what I want you to know about Paul. That Paul is one of the most incredible people ever to walk this planet. And the influence that he had was incredible, but it honestly was because he just used the things that he had available to him. So he had a good grasp of the, the Greek language. He understood the Roman culture because he was from Tarsus. And there were other things that were going on around that really propagated and helped to build what Paul was trying to do. So he understood the Roman culture. He understood the Greek language and the Greek culture. And he also understood God as revealed in Christ. And so he used all of these things to his advantage to really spread the gospel message. And so wherever he went, if he had to, to, to get out some communication, he would write a letter. And because of the, the transportation system at the time, he could get those letters out. Now, some of you know this, but in the Roman Empire at the time, which was expansive, they had over five, they had over, I think it was 50,000. Let me look at that number, make sure it's right. 50,000 miles of hard road, 50,000 miles all the way through the Roman Empire. Now, just to give you a little comparison, we, our youth group is in Anchorage, Alaska uh, in, on a mission trip. If you got in your car and you drove there today, you, first of all, you're crazy, but if you got there and you drove there today, 4,500 miles. In the Roman Empire, 50,000 miles of roads. 
And Paul knew how to use that to his advantage to spread the gospel, to travel from place to place. Just as the Romans would move troops, he would move around and tell people about this gospel message and really share it with them. So he used his influence, he used his awareness um, to, to really change, to change the world. One of the things that I, I'll, I'll just go ahead and mention quickly. Um, in his life, he challenged topics like relationships, so at that time, women were considered to be property. Children were just others. They were born, and oftentimes they weren't really even named because we didn't know how long they would survive. Well, he starts to reshape the dynamic of families, and he talks about husbands loving your wives, and he talks about wives submitting to your husbands, but it's inside of the act of both of them working together in obedience to Christ that you see the relationship start to be formed. And children, be obedient to your parents, and so they pull them in, and parents love your children and do not exasperate them. And so he, he doesn't just write about this, this Christian message. He starts to, to reshape society as a whole. And I don't know that I can even tell you the gravity of, of what he leaned into. This Roman society and this Roman culture, he started to change it from the inside out by proclaiming Christ and the belief that he had in, in the resurrection of Christ and what he learned from the gospel message. So he starts with families and then he starts to teach about these communities. If you're in a community and somebody is in a, is in a funeral situation where they're mourning, you pull alongside them and you mourn with them. If you go into a community and somebody is celebrating, you pull alongside them and you celebrate with them as well. If there are people, widows and orphans, you care for them. It's one of the markers that you read about in antiquity. Uh, Christians were so weird because they cared for people that were throwaways, people that had no value. Why would Christians waste their money and waste their time doing this? Because Paul taught them to. He added value to life. And it was in this way that he shaped the world we get a lot of the ways that we think about society today and values. It all started with his writing and with the way that he leaned into his faith. And so he gets on that ship, the ship is wrecked, he finds his way to Rome, and I'm gonna go ahead and pick up for you in Acts chapter 28, verse 16, how we get set up to write this letter to the Colossians. In verse 16, it says this. When we came into Rome, Paul was allowed to live by himself with the soldier who was guarding him. Now, it'd be easy to read that and just skip right on over it. Here's what I want you to hear. In Rome, there were many people that were imprisoned, but Rome didn't have that many prisons. So what they would do is they'd put people under house arrest and they would assign a soldier to you. And when it was time for that person to be called to trial, that soldier had the responsibility of getting that person to trial in a short amount of time, or that person, that soldier, might be killed. So how many of you know they got them there and they didn't lose them because otherwise they knew that they would be in trouble. So he's in this house setting with a soldier there with him with the freedom to write, with the freedom to visit, to spend time with, to expound upon his truth, to, to allow visitors to come. Does, it, does this help you draw you into maybe how we get the letters that we read about? Because you think of him in prison and chains. How does he sit there and write? This makes sense. It allows you to, to see maybe how Paul was able to do this. Verse 17, um, and, and let me set this up. In verse 17, all the way through the rest of this, you're gonna get a little flavor of the way that Paul went about his business because he, he did this in every city that he went into. He found ways to open doors to share the gospel message. Sometimes it was kind of a bait and switch, but, but he didn't care because he wanted people to hear about Jesus. So this is gonna give you a flavor of what he did in every single city that he went into. So he's arrested, he's in Rome, which according to Jesus is the ends of the earth. So he's, he's taking the gospel message to the ends of the earth, verse 17. Three days later, he called together the local leader of the Jews. When they had assembled, he said to them, brothers, though I had done nothing against our people or the customs of our ancestors, yet I was arrested in Jerusalem and handed over to the Romans. When they had examined me, the Romans wanted to release me. I just want you to know that. The Romans wanted to let me go because there was no reason for the death penalty in my case. So he's telling them, the Romans wanted to let me go, but, verse 19, when the Jews objected, I was compelled to appeal to the emperor even though I had no charge to bring against my nation. He said, so the Jews there in Jerusalem, they were ready to kill me and my only recourse was to come here to Rome. I have no objection against my nation. In fact, this message that I have, I believe is for you. 
So here I find myself, verse 20, for this reason, therefore, I have asked to see you and to speak with you, since it is for the sake of the hope of Israel that I am bound with this chain. Guys, this message is for you. I'm here in prison, but man, this, you got to listen to what I have to say. I love Paul, that he's not willing to lean into the influence that he has. Verse 21, they replied, we've received no letters from Judea about you, and none of the brothers coming here has reported or spoken anything evil about you. Not yet. They're on the way. He beat them all there. Verse 22, but we would like to hear from you what you think. For with regard to this sect, and they're talking about Christianity or the way, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. So they said, well, you know, we've not heard anything bad about you, but you know some information that we need. And we've heard about this sect and a lot of people are complaining about it. So give us the information that we need so that we can make a determination for ourselves. Which I'm going to tell you, Paul's like, suckers. Like, he's like, yeah, now I can tell you all about Jesus. Because that's what he wanted. He wanted to tell them about this faith. And so he's got the door open. Verse 23. After they had set a day to meet with him, they came to him at his lodgings in great numbers. And from morning until evening, he explained the matter to them, testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus, both from the law of Moses and from the prophets. Verse 24, some were convinced by what he had said, while others refused to believe. And I'm going to tell you, in every single city and village that he visited, same response. Some of the Jews believed, some didn't. But he would always take those who did believe and use them to now reach into the Gentile population or continue to spread the message in the, Jew, the Jewish population. Verse 25. So they disagreed with each other. So now they're fighting amongst each other. And as they were leaving, Paul made one further statement. So how many of you here, don't raise your hands, you always have to have the last word. You may be more like Paul than you think, right? Um, this always shows up in texting. You ever have somebody that's texting you and you just can't get out of it? It's like an endless loop where you, you say the last word and then they say something. You're like, oh, I'm not going down like that. And so you, and it just continues to roll. You guys all know what I'm talking about. You're doing it right now and you can, somebody just won't stop texting you. So there you go. Paul made one further statement. And anytime you make one last statement, it may not be okay. He says this, the Holy Spirit was right in saying that your ancestors, uh, in saying to your ancestors through the prophet Isaiah, go to this people and say, you will indeed listen, but never understand. And you will indeed look, but never perceive. For this people's heart is grown dull and their ears are hard of hearing and they have shut their eyes so that they might not look with their eyes and listen with their ears and understand with their heart and turn and I would heal them. He says, you're just, just like your ancestors. You're not willing to listen or to hear anything. So you can see this is the Paul character starting to rise up. And then he ends with this, verse 28. Let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. I think that went. We don't, we don't know. We don't, we don't get to hear from him. We just know that he's in prison for the next two years. So it probably didn't go very well. Um, but he's just willing to speak the truth and really lay it out there. So here's the verse that I really want you to see, verses 30 and 31. It says, he lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. And here's where I just want to stop for a second and tell you that this is where you get the setting that some of our letters were written and so it was during this time that we believe the letter to the Ephesians, Colossians, Philemon, uh, Philippians was written. It said that he was there at his own expense. That means that people had to come support him. So all of those missionary journeys that he was on, people would travel long distances to come to make sure that he had food and he had all the things that he had. And so he would write a letter and he'd say, hey, on your way back through Laodicea, drop this off in Colossae. Whatever it was, that's how he would continue to spread the message while being stuck inside of Rome in this two-year period of time. Now, is that helpful for anybody to kind of see how we get to that place? Maybe not, but anyways, you, you can sort of see where these other letters come from as he's stuck, unable to travel, unable to move around, but he doesn't stop. He continues to influence the world by sharing the word and by getting it out. So, which brings us to the Colossians. Yay! 
okay, right? Like there is an end to this message at some point today. You guys are all like, man, we're never getting out of here. So which brings us to Colossians or Colossae. Let me tell you a little bit about this, this community. And I want to do this so that you can understand what we're dealing with when we get into the message two, two weeks from now. So um, this, we've got a map. We're going to throw the map back up. Um, back here to Ephesus in the center. If you came over 100 miles to the right of that or 100 miles to the east and just dropped the little pin, you would find Colossae. It's also, there's another church that was there. You guys may recognize this name, Laodicea. So Laodicea is the church in Revelation where Jesus says, you're neither hot nor cold. I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. That's the church in Laodicea, but that's where it was, right there to the right of of Ephesus is where this church was. So um, Colossae is this uh, amazing community that we don't know a whole lot about because it's never really been excavated. Now, when I heard that, it just broke my heart because I thought, well, surely we've turned over every stone about every Bible verse and everything that we've ever done. It's in a place in Turkey where they're just not that excited about digging it up. Um, the, all of the archaeological digs have taken place in Laodicea and some of the bigger surrounding areas, but this particular place, not a lot of digs, not a lot of interest, not a lot of, of information. So w- what do Bible scholars do in those moments? You guys all know, what do they do? They make stuff up. No, I'm kidding. They make stuff up based on surrounding regions and educated guesses. And so some of this is that, and some of this is what they actually have found in that place. So at one point in its heyday, uh, there was believed to be 25 to 30,000 inhabitants in the city, and you get that number because Rome built a theater in Colossae, which seats about 5,000. And so from other cities, you can estimate that maybe it was about that size. They had a lot of agricultural trade. Um, So uh, figs, dates, uh, olives, just just like what you would know to be in that particular region were there. But here's the real unique part of their trade. So wool was a big piece, but not just any wool. There was a flower um, that grew in that area, and I totally jacked the name of it earlier. Uh, Is it cyclamen? There's a flower that grew there. Um, Here's the flowers. You can go and put that up there. These beautiful red and purple flowers. And they would take those flowers and they would draw from them a dye that they would dye the wool. And the wool would come out with these beautiful reds and beautiful purples. And it really set Colossae up as being just this amazing place where you could go and trade and you could pick up this wool that was just so unique to that particular region. And so when you hear olives and figs and dates and wool, you know that in that community was a, was a strong Jewish population. And so when you think of religions, you had a Jewish population. Now you know you have a Christian population. But here's the other religion that was there. This Gnostic um, belief system, which is a, a worship, if you will, of spiritual deities, um, where they thought that Michael the archangel represented more of God than others. And so for them, what was written and what was applicable to our lives today wasn't as important as the spiritual side. And so they would just take these other religious belief systems and blend them in and they would focus on worshiping these spirits instead of, of what we believe to be God. And so for them, when they heard the message of Jesus, well, he just became an archangel, maybe more important than even Michael, and they started worshiping Jesus, but not as God, they worshiped Jesus as as an angel. And so part of what you're going to get in this message that was written to, to the church in Colossians is them dealing with Jesus as being supreme, Jesus as being Lord. And so Paul works to clarify and to clean up that message. Um, Colossians was a, I've only got a couple minutes. Colossians was, um, was a prominent city. There was an earthquake in 17 AD, which messed up the road. They rebuilt the road, but they built it farther to the north going into Laodicea. And so the population started to fall apart, became less as people started to migrate out. And so it's possible that when Paul wrote this letter to to Colossae, that there would have been a very small church from some of the house churches that they found in this place, maybe a church of 30 to 45 people. I think that's pretty awesome to know that we're studying this text and it was written to such a small group of people, but it's so very important. So which brings us to the text. And um, I'm just going to read verses 1 and 2 and then 24 all the way through the end. And then I promise we're going to close this up and get us out of here. So in Colossians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, Paul writes this. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers and sisters in Christ in Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. You say, Scott, why'd you read that? I want you to know that it's literally a letter. That there's Paul 
with Timothy, and they're writing from their heart to the people that are there in Colossae. This is a letter that's written to a group of people, and they're going to entrust that somebody's going to deliver it, and somebody's going to read it for them. So when you read it, you can read it as a letter, something that was sent to that community to help them. And then through the rest of chapter one, and we're going to unpack this in two weeks, is some of the most beautiful, deep theological truths about Jesus being the revealing of the Father. And he starts to move towards that place of the importance of Jesus and getting him into his, his right place in our lives. But he ends, verse, he ends the chapter with these few verses that kind of speak to what the whole book is all about. Verse 24, he says, I'm now rejoicing in my sufferings for your sake. And in my flesh, I am completing what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body that is the church. Now you could read that and you could say, Scott, is he saying that what Jesus did wasn't complete? No, Paul's belief was that we suffer with Christ in the spread of the gospel. So we're completing his sufferings. When we continue to live into this gospel and we take hardships upon ourselves for the spread of the gospel, we are sharing in that with Christ. And so when he says that we are um, completing what is lacking, we are adding to the full work and the embodiment of what Christ did on the cross. Verse 25, he says, I became its servant according to God's commission that, I, that, that was given to me for you. Now, here's where he says, I was called to do this. God commissioned me to do this, to make the word of God fully known. The mystery that has been hidden throughout the ages and generations, but has now been revealed to his saints. So he says, I've been commissioned to share this message with you that from all time has been hidden, but has now been revealed. That it's been my purpose and my desire, and God has called me to tell people about this. Verse 27. To them, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery. In other words, God is revealing himself not only to the Jews, but to the Gentiles as well. His glorious riches are starting to pour out, and we're seeing evidence of that in the Gentile nation. And here's the big turning point. This big message, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And so what he says is everything that I'm talking about, everything that I know, everything that I've been put on this earth for and called to do is to tell you about Christ. Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's what everything I'm gonna talk about, that's what this entire book has to do with. Verse 28, he says, it is he whom we proclaim warning everyone and teaching everyone in all wisdom so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil and struggle with all energy that he powerfully inspires within me. In other words, I'm going to do everything I can to tell you about this Jesus, to teach you, to help you to mature, to help you to grow in your awareness of who Jesus is. That's how he ends that first section and that verse thought um, in, in this book. And so we'll spend the next four weeks after we get back from vacation Bible school unpacking that, diving into it, and really just looking at the culture and maybe what it had to say to them. And so you may say, Scott, well, what does this have to do with me? And here's my, my three minutes, two thoughts. The first one is this. The more I read about Paul, the more I appreciate what he did. That in Paul, in his life, starting out as a Pharisee that was regionally located in Jerusalem, he started to use his influence to change the world. One step at a time, leaning into the things that he knew about to make a difference. And you say, Scott, what does that have to do with me? Every single person in this room has an area of influence. Whether you're a teacher or a dad or a mom, a grandparent, a mentor, even if you find yourself in the loneliest place of your life, you, you are interacting with people. You're spending time with people. And I'm going to tell you, there are opportunities for us in our lives to impact and to influence the world that's around us. You know, when we turn on the news and we, five minutes later, we shut it off because we can't take any more of it. You know, the thing that breaks my heart is if we as Christians leaned into this world and loved people the way that Jesus did, a lot of that stuff wouldn't be going on. Because we'd be working to transform our workplaces and learning to love people that society deems unlovable. L learning to stand alongside people that are throwaways in life. It's exactly what Paul did during his time. And so maybe for you, part of this message is to inspire you to say whatever areas of influence you have, use the influence that God has given you to start to change the world around you. And I'm going to tell you, it starts right here inside of our hearts, which is where we get to the second point. The message that changed the world then is the message that changed the world today that this Jesus is the hope of the world. Jesus in you, the hope of glory. 
We can go out and we can try and do anything and everything that we want to do, but apart from this, it's not eternal. When you lean into the purpose and the design that God has given you in life, you can change things that will last long past your days on this earth. And for those of you who are, are here and maybe you've never had an opportunity to believe, this is that part of the message where you get to hear about a God that revealed himself to humanity. Humanity that was so broken, who, who tried to fill itself with every other thing. That part of humanity has not ever changed. Until we come to this place to where the message is different. What does it mean to have a God that loves you enough that he actually gives something to you? This sacrificial love, somebody that's willing to give their life for you. And when you start to wrestle that message to the ground, I'm going to tell you, it'll profoundly impact and change your life. And that type of love starts with the knowledge of Jesus as being the expression of God. And that is exactly what Paul leans into as he tries to help the Colossian church get to that place. And so my prayer today for those of you who maybe have never made a decision to believe in Jesus is that maybe today you can do that. You're never going to fully understand it, I promise. It took Paul years to get to the place to where he could live fully into his calling. But maybe for us, we can start by allowing it to transform our hearts. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you. God, we thank you for people like Paul. God, we, we are today directly impacted by the ministry and by his reach into the world. And Lord, I know in a room of this size with this many people, that there are people in this room that are gonna change the world just through the way that they live their lives. It could be somebody that they, that they care for. It could be something that they invent. It could be a place that they go. It could be policy that they write. It could be any number of things, but God, you've empowered us with the ability to be led by your Holy Spirit to change this world for eternity as we seek to love and to serve you. And so God, I pray that you would do that deep work inside of us and allow us to start solving some of this garbage that we see going on in the world around us because you've given us that ability. Lord, we love you. We trust you. And it all starts with your son, Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Now I encourage you to listen to the words of this song. They're powerful. Um, and I believe that they'll speak to your heart. Let's take a moment to allow God to speak to you and then we'll let you get, get loose and, and enjoy your day. I've carried a burden for too long on my own. I wasn't created to bear it alone. So I'll run to the 
Father again and again and again and again. Will you stand with me? So this is going to be a fun, crazy week. And so for those of you who aren't going to be here in the thick of it, you can be praying for us. Please, Jesus, I ask you to do that. But um, just praying that God does a deep work inside of you in this church. I don't know about y'all, but I'm sick of some of the things that I see going on in society. And I believe we have something to say about it. And we can start here in our hearts and in our lives and then just see what God can do in this world. Heavenly Father, as we go from this place, I pray that you would lead us and guide us, um, use us in, in ways that we never could have even possibly imagined to bring about thy kingdom. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done. Lord, we love you, we trust you. And it's in Jesus' name, amen.